Greetings, bird people. It's time for Out There with the Birds, the podcast that's both birdie and out there, with your hosts, Ben Lizdis and Bill Thompson III. Out There with the Birds is supported by Koa Sporting Optics, makers of the legendary 883 Promenar Spotting Scope. Visit sportingoptics.coa-usa.com to learn more. Additional support comes from the Reader Rendezvous Birding Adventures from Birdwatchers Digest. Come birding with us in our favorite places. Learn more at birdwatchersdigest.com slash rr. And now here they are, Bill and Ben. Okay, we're rolling. Fantastic. Episode 15 of Out There with the Birds. Ben Lizdis is back in his home studio in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. I'm here at the Woo-hoo! the big international birdhouse at Birdwatcher's Digest. How you doing, Ben? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Bill? I'm doing all right. It's a it's a beautiful day and uh, starting off kind of early, but that's. I the, think t- I think today's the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. It is. It is now. People in terms know of when, daylight hours. Now, <laughs> technically, all days are 24 hours. Right. So. And you just put a time but, stamp on this episode, so people know how long it takes me to edit them. <laughs> We've been wandering all over the planet on our topics lately, and I was thinking that today it might be a good uh, a good topic might be music and birds. What do you think about that? Now you're talking about um, birds and the music that they play, birds and music that they like. Tell me a little bit about this music and birds. We know there's a connection, obviously. Birds sing, um, you know, and and, and uh, song is part of part of birding life for sure. Tell me, tell me where you're going with this. Well, where I'm going with this is a couple different places. One is we, we all know that uh, birding by ear is, is a huge thing. And, and for many of us, like for me, one of my first bird memories was a male Northern Cardinal singing outside my grandma's house when we used to come out from Iowa and visit to Ohio when I was a little kid, back when dinosaurs walked the earth. And... <laughs> I remember that bird so vividly. I remember looking up and seeing this thing in the steamy summer morning, singing up in a magnolia. Uh, and it really struck me that, gosh, this bird, he was singing, what cheer? What, you know? And it was so remarkable to hear that sounded like a human whistle to me. And of course, there are lots mm-hmm. of other birds that can mimic things better than a cardinal he wasn't mimicking that was just what his song was but it it stuck with me even though i wasn't yet a bird watcher i was probably five or six years old so i also want to talk about the fact that there are tons of uh connections between people who love birding and birding by ear and bird song and people who love music i think that's an interesting thing in fact it's something i wrote about in the just recently released good birders still don't wear white my chapter was uh all about the connection between birders and music. So, so you're, you're you're somewhat of an authority on the subject. I wouldn't say that, but I'm <laughs> I'm passionate about both birds and music. And I remember mm-hmm. years ago when we were starting the magazine. I remember my dad having a conversation. It might have been with Roger Tory Peterson, um, and I was listening in on it and and chimed in a little bit that he felt that the ear that he used as a piano player, as a jazz musician, to fit in to whatever, you know, composition he was playing with a band, or even when he was playing by himself to play something that was, you know, felt good or pleasing to the ear. He felt that that was the same sort of aural, A-U-R-A-L, capability that he used when he was birding. And he was a pretty new birder when we started the magazine. So I think it's I just think it's a cool connection. The, the, the chapter I wrote was called Bird Songs, Birders, and Musicians. So um, I just think it's a neat thing because I do know a lot of people who are um, avid birders and also either musicians themselves or great singers or, if not those, s- super into music, you know, really mm-hmm. big fans of music. Like you, for example. And- you're, you're not... You yeah. wouldn't consider yourself necessarily a musician, but you're a super music fan. That's true. That's true. I have no rhythmic or musical talents or capabilities whatsoever. And everyone who knows me will tell you that the last person you want to hear singing, whether it's happy birthday or you name it, 
is me. No one wants to hear me sing that. However, I absolutely love music. Um, do you think that this love of you know, the, the love of music comes first, and then people get turned on to bird watching because they just find that that those neurons are already kind of hardwired. They're already used to listening to things. They already have a sensitive ear, and they realize. Wow, bird watching. There's a lot of bird listening involved in this, and it's just sort of an instant connection almost. I think so. I mean, whether you come to it, I was a musician after I was a bird watcher. My dad was the other way around. But uh, yeah, and mm -hmm. I just think that if you've got the that talent for hearing, uh, you know, discerning tonality, discerning uh, melody, I think it's it can be applied Pitch. a bunch of different places. For example, I would be mm -hmm. willing to bet that somebody who was a really good musician or a big fan of music and had a talent for discerning different styles of music and different compositions and so forth, I bet you that person, you could pick them up and they would be a good ear birder. And I also bet they would be somebody who was good at picking up regional dialects in human language or different uh. accents or diff you know what I mean? I just think if you yep. have an ear talent, it's just like people who have super sharp eyes. I've gone out with tons of brand new birders. My friend Sheila, when she started out bird watching, she was unbelievable at spotting. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know why that is. I mean, it, is it because she's got a visual acuity that's above average? Or is it because her eyes weren't biased by thinking, okay, well, we should be seeing hawks. Where are the hawks? Instead, she's looking, hey, look, a bunch of swallows. I mean, she was always spotting mm -hmm. birds before the rest of us. It's kind of uncanny. So I think... I think certain people are just born with an acuity. So let's go to a let's mm -hmm. go to a speed round now. Here's I was just okay. I did a little I asked Mr. Google. Here are here are the on ranker.com, that's R A N K E R, not R A N C O R. There were the 30 cool band names. And here they are. Swans, oh, these are band names that have birds. Swans, the goslings, yellow swans, the yardbirds, the birds Flock of Seagulls, one of your favorite bands, the OJs, mm -hmm. that's the stretch, the Crows, the Black Crows, Eagle Eye Cherry, Dixie Chicks, Them Crooked Vultures, I like that name, Chicken Foot, Cheryl Crow, not her fault, the Ravionettes, <laughs> Jayhawks, great band, Counting Crows, overrated band, the Flamingos, the Fabulous Thunderbirds, which has Stevie Ray Vaughan's little brother in it, and, and the Albatross, the Eagles, oh my gosh, Owls, Black Hawk Band, Owl City, The House Martins, Pelican, Jimmy's Chicken Shack, and Old Crow Medicine Show. Uh, the Mint Chicks, Department of Eagles, The Wild Swans, The Martins, Eagles of Death Metal, The Starlings, and on it goes, on it goes. And of course, I'm in a band called The Rain Crows, and I've always had, mm -hmm. I was in a band briefly called The Prairie Chickens. Uh, but I just think there's something about music and birds that's a cool connection. So, and, you know, I, I knew we were going to be talking a little bit about this, so I was searching the internets as well, just to kind of figure out, you know, what are some well-known musicians mm -hmm. who are birders? And a couple of names that stood out to me that I thought of people, our audience would know this. According to Wikipedia, Mick Jagger was a yeah. birder. Have you ever heard of that before? Yeah, I have. I have. That one caught um, me off. And there. Ian, uh, what's his name from Jethro Tull? Ian Anderson is evidently a... A birder. I mean, you know, you hear those rumors all the time. When, when, when I read that Mick Jagger was a birder, I was thinking, the first thing that came to mind was like prairie chickens right. on a lack. Right. Mick Jagger out there. <laughs> you know, just like, <laughs> and the guy's exactly. having to tell him, Mick, um, could you quit moving Vandals. around and prancing around? And they're scaring the prairie chickens. Yeah. Right. Van Morrison oh, really? was another one. Okay. Bird watcher. Yep. And then from, I think this is a band that is way overrated in my opinion and we might get some negative feedback on this because I know a lot of people love this band Rush Neil Peart oh, I, Rush yeah, that's, Birdwatcher I read Neil Peart's uh, autobiography and uh, the two running themes in it were music and birds I mean he's been a birder since he was a kid oh ah. yeah I was never a huge huh. Rush fan myself but I admire their musicality those guys they play some of the most complicated arrangements on the planet and they do it with utter precision and mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I admire Rush. I'm never a huge fan, but I and Neil Peart's, you know, my drummer friends consider him way up there in the ranks of uh, drummers. So mm -hmm. you know, so let's think of some songs that have birds in them, and we'll we'll invite people to write in 
to uh, editor at Birdwatcher's Digest, and we can share some of these if if they want. You know, I've many mm-hmm. times been playing a, a show and had people shout "Free Bird," right? <laughs> Made the bird of paradise fly up your nose. You know, there's there's tons of birds. Bird is the word. Yeah, bird is the word. Uh, Blackbird by the Beatles. Sing it in the dead of night. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you go back to you know, birds that have bird sounds have been mimicked in um, classical music dating back to the 14th century from what I was reading. Um, the cuckoo and the nightingale, two really common birds that you can find essentially, you know, mimicked in mm-hmm. music by, you know, Beethoven, Handel, or Spieke, Vivaldi, um, you know, particularly the cuckoo is one of those birds. That it, and obviously such a distinct call resonating, you know, you can hear it from, you know, a great distance. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, it makes sense like, oh, you know, the people in that day and age, that bird's going to pop up in terms of, you know, right. audio. Right. What about Chopin? Did he ever have any compositions that were based on birds? Frederick Is that Chopin? A question? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I was a kid and I had piano lessons, you would get stamps if you did your lesson well from this horrible <laughs> old piano teacher. And uh, I remember running out to the car. My mom tells a story. <laughs> running out to the car one time with my book. Mom, mom, I got two choppins and a scummin. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was that was also I was also the kid who, when the piano teacher said, "What comes after G on the scale?" I said H. <laughs> <laughs> that was not good. That was not good. But yet you turned out to be a talented musician. So. Yeah, but not from any of the schooling I got. It was strictly by osmosis. And if you think about that, <clears throat> birds learn their songs, many of them. Some of them are born with a, a little map for a song in their brain, according to ornithologists. Mm-hmm. While others have, are, we, we know they learn songs. So, um, yeah. And I read this mm-hmm. really interesting article recently about cowbirds. Uh, an ornithologist wondered, how does a cowbird know it's a cowbird? How does it learn the cowbird song, like if it's a male cowbird? That's fascinating. Yeah. What he found was, at night, young cowbirds leave the nest right at dusk, and they go out and they gather in a nearby field. And when they're gathered there, they collectively learn the songs. It's almost like they're sneaking out of the house right. to like and, get back. And with then their they go back to the brethren. nest and get fed more by their, you know, adoptive parents. Isn't that cool? Wow. So what the scientists did, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, so I'll have to apologize because I got a C in ornithology. All right, so yeah. I'm not an ornithologist. <laughs> never claimed to be. Didn't even play one on TV. Um, he kept captive uh, nestling cowbirds, and they did if they weren't. A, permitted to go out in these, you know, dusk gatherings of cowbirds, they did pick up the song of their host father, their, the, the male of their host really? family. Yeah. So <clears throat> in a rudimentary way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So cowbirds, nestlings, sneak away from their, the parents that they're parasitizing, go learn the song from other cowbirds in the fields and come back to the nest. That's dastardly. That is dastardly. That is dastardly. So, so I grew up in a nest, uh, in a in a house, you know, not in a nest, <laughs> that um, where music was just constantly in the air. My dad was a jazz musician. My mom was a singer, and there was music going on all the time. Music friends used to come by, jam with my parents in the evenings and stuff. And I just learned to love music naturally. So I feel like I'm kind of like a bird in that way, and that the music, you know, I can't get enough music. Yeah. And I I love to play it. I love to listen to it. I love to write it. I love to enjoy other people's music. I mean, it's, I just, I'm hungry for it all the time. And I think that's because I grew up, it was a natural part of my, the audio landscape that I, the audio scape that I grew up with. Mm-hmm. Well, and you, I, you know, you wonder too, how much of that is um, your ability to discern tone and pitch, mm-hmm. how much of that is learned and how much of that might just be somewhat hardwired into your brain because we're talking about birds and how some birds can have this fluid or dynamic ability of learning songs, whether it be, you know, the, 
um, you know, the cowbird who doesn't get out of the nest learning, you know, just picking up on the song of its parent, or else, of course, these, you know, birds that just are hardwired to sing their song. Um, and, and, and there's a range there. And you, you think, you'd think with people, the obviously, you know, the neurology behind humans and birds is very different, but some of those mechanisms might be not entirely different from one another. No, no, I, I totally agree. <clears throat> I do think you can be born with it because I have seen, you know, videos on TV programs about learning where there are kids who are naturally born with an aptitude for perfect pitch. And perfect pitch is, if if you had perfect pitch, I could have you blindfold yourself and I could play a note on an instrument, a piano, a guitar, mm -hmm. a flute, and you yeah. could tell me, oh, that's a D, that's yeah. an F. So people, I don't have perfect pitch, but I know people who do. And a couple of them are burger friends of mine. And I can tell you right now, they are unbelievably gifted ear birders. Yeah. They can, they can learn song bird songs so much more quickly than the average person. I think the average person goes out on a May morning, uh, you know, the height of migration. And what they hear is a cacophony, like the symphony orchestra warming up, just all the mm -hmm. instruments playing at once, all the birds sing at once. And it's really, really hard for them to discern stuff. Whereas the attuned ear of the birder or the gifted musical ear that's being adapted for birding can pick out those individual birds, those individual orchestra instruments, and just pick them out and set them aside and concentrate on the next one that's different. Pick that out and set it aside. I've watched some of my musician friends do this and it's uncanny. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. So anyway, I've got some tips for people for uh, for learning about bird song, and this oh. is from again, this is from uh, Good Birders Still Don't Wear White, that the end of the chapter, um, where I kind of talked about a lot of the stuff that we've talked about here. But um, if you're trying to learn bird songs, one of the best ways ways to do that is to, is to hear an unfamiliar song and follow it until you find the bird that's singing it. I did that when, yeah. with a tufted titmouse when I was in high school. I was sitting in class, heard this bird, couldn't figure out what it was. My history teacher, Mr. Barron, said, all right, bird man, do I, <clears throat> are you wondering what that bird is? Go find out what it is and tell us. So I went out. Our school was built in a ravine. I went out, eventually found the birds, came back in, and without even thinking, he said, all right, what was it? And I said, tufted titmouse. Well, you can imagine what the 10th grade yeah. history class did with that. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, the, other, the other really – so – Seeing the bird singing that song that's been unfamiliar to you can help cement it in your mind that that is a tufted titmouse or whatever. Um, compare the unfamiliar song to the familiar. So learn the cardinal song, learn the cactus wren song, learn the you know the song sparrow song. I, I feel song sparrow is a really good one. Yeah. And then if you hear an unfamiliar song, ask yourself why is that not a song sparrow or a goldfinch? Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> and it. Try to describe it to yourself and make notes, and then you can go back and look at, listen to it. And using mnemonics, of course, is a really good thing. Um, like who cooks for you for the barred owl or pleased to meet you, Miss mm -hmm. Beecher, for the chestnut-sided warbler. Those are ones that when I was a kid learning bird song from my birding mentor, those really, really helped me to remember. Now, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, yeah, right, that sounds like a lot of work, you can take the uh, easy way out and just download uh, one of the you know new bird song apps, they're, they're apps coming out all the time that will help you identify birds. and By song. By song. And also by visual. You know, Merlin, the thing from Cornell Lab. Yeah. Can upload a, a pretty crummy picture and it'll fairly accurately tell you what the bird is. But there are also um, now apps coming out that are sort of like Shazam for mm -hmm. birding. So mm -hmm. that's, I've that's heard a, mixed that's reviews on, on the effectiveness of those, but no doubt the fact that they've get dipped their toes in those waters, these app developers, you're going to get you know further yep. development of it, progress. No doubt it's actually going to be like a real highly functioning type of a thing. I'm, yep. I'm sure of it. I, I, I wouldn't tell any birder at the moment that they could rely 100% on those Absolutely audio not. apps at and the moment. Anyways. Fun to mess with. So you got yeah. anything else for us today? Well, you know, I was thinking about um, uh, bird songs and kind of checking to see what interesting bits of science or news tidbits I could find out and did come across an interesting study of, uh, I think it was eastern wood peewees 
in the DC area, they had they, they were studying the effect of high traffic noise on these birds and their ability to communicate either to defend territory or to attract mates. And so they took these three parks in the DC area and they monitored the behavior of the birds. And there there were periods of time where these their habitat was adjacent to a road that was going constantly and then it would be shut down for 36 hours at a time for some construction, some maintenance. Um, essentially, there was no traffic on it for this period of time. They found out that when the traffic period was high, these peewees would essentially have a shorter song, mm -hmm. but it would be more intense to essentially get their volume out there. So these birds were essentially taking their songs, compressing them, having higher volume, more intensity, but shorter, and really essentially having a negative impact on their ability to sing their natural song, you know, the, what they've right. evolved in, but having to just go over the crowd. Yeah. Essentially. So, um, you know, another example of birds sort of on the fly, changing their behavior, modifying their song to account for the environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the long run, I suppose, you know, what's worse, uh, being drowned out by traffic or having to modify our song to get over it. Probably right. neither of them are ideal, but, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Bob Dylan going live at, with, uh, going from the acoustic to the electric at Prince Albert Hall. You know, he turns up the volume to get above the hecklers. You know, you just kind of have this solution where, you know, <laughs> all right, Pee-wee's now it's time for the electric set. You know, here comes the traffic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, man, that's interesting stuff. And there have been a lot of studies similar to that with urban birds, urban settings and bird song, mm -hmm. having to do with, you know, light. Sometimes light makes stuff like birds like robins sing all night long because the mercury yeah. lights are stimulating them to do it. It's, any kind of stimulus like that, I think, can have a very deleterious effect on birds, um, anything unnatural. But that's the world we live in now. Yeah, it's it's interesting and you know fascinating to see as you know people we, we encroach more and more on habitat for animals and how the animals are evolving and changing to you know get around you know these little obstacles that we put in front of them be it traffic or right. buildings or you know whatnot um, and it, being able to observe it firsthand is pretty fascinating stuff it's a little bit sad of course because you'd like to think that they would be able to keep doing things as they've done for thousands of years but yeah. you know we live in a dynamic world and looks like the eastern wood peewees are uh keeping up with uh, the changes here yeah golly nuts well i have a musical <laughs> recommendation this week again oh really i'm back on the track with those yep you know ah. last week it was delicate steve the last yeah, episode yeah. this episode i'm going back to another old favorite um amy mann I don't know if you know who Amy Mann is. I know who Amy Mann is. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with her catalog, but I, I definitely know Amy Mann. So she heard, was a you know the, she the was, more popular song. She was a she singer played. and a bass player in a band called uh, Till Tuesday back in the I think 80s. Oh yeah, and uh, I remember Till Tuesday. Got a Boston great band had that song Voices Carry was kind of a big hit. Mm -hmm. Then she kind of went off on her own and has had a bunch of great albums and she's done some soundtracks for movies and stuff. Anyway, her new album is called Mental Illness. And uh, I listened to a couple songs on it, uh, sampled them, and just thought, wow, this is really great. She's a super talented singer, phenomenal lyricist, and it writes great melodies. This Mental Illness album is phenomenal. It's got a song on it called Goose Snow Cone. Not Snow Goose Cone. Goose Snow Cone. Goose Snow Cone. It just, it's, a, it's my brain worm right now. It's phenomenal. All right. Great All singer. Right. So I recommend Amy Mann, A-I-M-E-E. M A N N mental illness. Great. Just came out. Fantastic album. All right. I'm going to go look that up, Bill today. All right, buddy. Well, I think that's about it. We're hitting the 24 minute mark here and we don't want people's ears to melt. Not this time around anyways, but, uh, I guess until next time we talk, I'll be turning it up to 11. Yep. I'm going to see if I can get it to go to 12. Nice. All right, buddy. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, see you, Bill. Bye. That's a wrap for this episode of Out There with the Birds. Special thanks to Koa, our optic sponsor. Learn more about their fine line of birding products at sportingoptics.coa-usa.com. We're also supported by the Reader Rendezvous Birding Adventures from Birdwatcher's Digest. 
Your next birding adventure starts at birdwatchersdigest.com slash rr. Tune in next time for some more yakking from the Krakens, Bill and Ben. Until then, keep your eyes to the skies and your hands off the pies, and we'll see you out there with the birds. Ciao!